so great to be here. Um, welcome everybody and, and thanks for uh, coming. I know it's late in your day. Um, and I'm just switching to get my slides up um, and say hello. Uh, I can't believe that uh, it seems like such a long time ago that, it was, that I was in Poland doing the masterclass. Um, and I feel very grateful that I had an opportunity to visit um, before the, the pandemic and they shut down um, shut us all down <laughs> and and I'm here in California and I'm we're still locked down um, but through the wonders of the internet I can sort of visit my friend with my friends um, in in Poland so uh, for the webinar um, I want to cover four different uh, areas I'm going to talk about uh, definition and process for NGO digital transformation um, I'm going to share some examples of how the pandemic has speeded up um, uh, NGO digital transformation uh, in the last two months. Uh, and many uh, nonprofits have said that they've been working on their digital transformation for years and talking about projects for years, but now they executed them very quickly because of the pandemic. And, um, and then some examples of emerging technology that's being used by NGOs. We'll leave time for questions. I hope you'll ask them in the chat. And, um, and if you want the slides, and I put together some additional reading uh, and links, uh, they're all at that URL there, that bit.ly. So, um, so beginning again with a definition of digital transformation, um, a technical, technological, cultural, and operational shift in which uh, organizations leverage data and digital channels to deliver stakeholder value and innovate with agility and sustain impact. Um, so, you see, um, so it's not just really about um, picking tools and using technology, really it's um, organizational and operational change. And the thing is, I don't like the word transformation because it implies that everything happens at once very quickly. Um, although we could use the term for digital transformation when we think about COVID. Um, and, um, and it's sort of uh, pre-COVID, my approach to it had been, you know, the digital transformation is a journey. It's really about maturity and gradual change um, that you go from, you know, assessing um, and figuring out where the gaps are and then putting together um, a plan that you implement and then um, uh, revise. And one of, uh, th there are different frameworks out there and different tools that you can use to help your organization go through a digital transformation journey. Um, I, I shared one from the UK during the masterclass, but I'd like to share this one now. Um, it's from NetHope and they have a whole digital nonprofit center. Um, and they have a pretty robust, um, uh, assessment um, instrument benchmarking tool that you can take with your organization and then you uh, you can bench see where your organization is compared to others are you far ahead in certain areas or are you with everybody else are you are you behind and it helps you analyze where the gaps are um, in your approach to, to um, uh, digital transformation. And the reason I chose NetHope, and um, some of you may be familiar with NetHope, but it's a, um, an association of, uh, for international NGOs. And I, I chose it because most of them have to work uh, as distributed um, staff, because there are many different areas. And, um, and now that I, you know, I'm not, 100% what your case is, but I'm assuming, um, like everyone else, you're probably working at home or you are limited in the office to sort of staggering shifts. So a lot of what they cover in their assessment um, helps you think through those. So there's an assessment piece to see where am I and, um, and uh, going a little bit deeper to figure out what are the gaps, um, what, what are the pain points in delivering our programs and services or communications or internal communications um, to different people. And, um, so, and the, the assessment covers different areas and you'll see it's not really about specific tech tools, it's really an organizational assessment so it looks at readiness or, you know, how motivated is the organization uh, to undergo digital transformation. And I'm sure readiness is different today <laughs> than it was a few months ago. Um, there's people, um, you know, does the organization prioritize digital skills for all of its personnel? Are people, you know, fluent? 
or getting fluent or getting the training. Um, it talks about process. Um, how is the how is your organization um, reimagining how it achieves mission and scale with speed? How you know reimagining how you're delivering your programs? And again, this is happening right now a lot with almost every nonprofit I've come across in the U.S. and it may on your end because of because of the virus. Um, the other is investment. Um, is it nimble and forward looking? And, um, and are you focused on impact? Um, data is a really big part of digital transformation. So is data valued? Is it protected? Is it considered an asset um, to improve impact and operations? And then finally, technology. Is technology seen as an enabler of change or driver of automation? So those are the uh, areas uh, where you, where uh, the assessment asks you questions about where your organization is. And then it gives you an analysis and you're put in one of four different categories of, of nonprofit. And the first is um, tech enabled and it's there in the lower left quadrant. And this is just really where an organization thinks about technology as a utility um, to sustain growth and operations, you know, business as usual. And technology is not really seen as a catalyst for change or beneficiary empowerment or program transformation. Then uh, right next to it on the other side, which is more on the operational focus, is the automated nonprofit. And they're focused on um, tech using technology uh, for efficiency, uh, mostly in finance, HR, legal, and digital fundraising. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there's data that exists for compliance and to answer traditional types of strategy questions such as how, how much do we fundraise for this? Where did we spend these funds? And what worked on what? what? So that's the automated um, uh, nonprofit with more of an operations focus. Um, and um, then in the upper uh, left, we have the connected nonprofit. And here, this is a, a program that's um, a nonprofit that's providing best in class uh, digital experience for partners and um, beneficiaries. Data is shared both internally with nonprofits and governments who service the same beneficiaries. Resources are allocated based on outcome and impact. And data is used to understand beneficiaries' perceptions regarding their experience in order to make better programs and mission results. And data is used to compare program output, outcomes, and impact across uh, the organization. So here, it's really focused on how, how can we use technology to better serve our stakeholders. And the digital nonprofit is where is sort of like the ideal place to be and to shift, um, where they can bridge the gap and transform how programs are delivered and combine the best of automated and connected nonprofit models. And, um, and it's really powerful in that this organization is very agile, um, they're unique, um, uh, they have open data to go along uh, to do a better job. Um, the largest change in this uh, part of the quadrant is that um, there's a mind shift change in terms of being able to scale and uh, realize impact. And digital nonprofits seek to build platforms for others to use and actively seek to find uh, external innovation to accelerate their mission. So these are the, 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 the uh, after you take the assessment, you're sort of put in one of these categories and you can then begin to figure out like, how do we begin, what are the gaps and what do we need to prioritize? Um, NetHope then has a very, um, another section to it that's different from some other digital transformation frameworks in that it provides a lot of um, guidance on how do you implement, what's the process for, okay, so now we know where we are, how do we begin to implement new ideas? And so they, it's, it's clever, they have a, it's called idea. So they have sort of an imagining process, um, you know, what, what are the possibilities? and then a design process where they're getting feedback from stakeholders. Then there's the implementation plan. And then of course it's assessed and um, it improved. So it's idea, imagine, like look at the possibilities for filling the gap, um, design it and test it with beneficiaries, whether they're internal stakeholders, staff or external beneficiaries, then creating an implementation plan with lots of piloting um, to get to full scale and then um, assessing. So the other thing that, um, that goes along with the digital transformation journey is of course skills. And 
And uh, NetHope, in addition to identifying what the skills are, they also have lots of resources on how you can train your staff or your organization in these different uh, sort of digital transformation skills. And they include um, tech literacy. And, you know, 20 years ago, we, we started with digital literacy, and that was all about um, how do we um, uh, effectively use the internet, with critical thinking skills, browsing, you know, putting up a website, but it's evolved now to tech literacy, which is that everybody in the organization has the foundational technical skills to be able to transform. So it includes a broader uh, uh, collection of programs. Collaboration. Um, do people seamlessly work across boundaries? And so, uh, uh, and this is, um, and especially now that we're distributed, um, if we're all distributed and working at home, how do we collaborate effectively? Or if you're a, a organization that's working throughout the whole country, um, uh, how do you uh, collaborate with your different partners? Complex problem solving, is the organization um, solving problems in an agile way in real time? Um, and and this, is, uh, this gets to uh, using data, figuring out like um, what to test, uh, doing a lot of A-B testing and, um, and learning from there. Digital responsibility, uh, this is all about security and privacy and keeping uh, people's um, information safe. It's also about having a positive online identity and building digital reputation and trust, which is a big, a big thing. Uh, creativity and uh, innovation. Does everybody contribute to new ideas? Um, and this gets at the idea of um, the ability really to revise and repurpose and reimagine um, you know, old programs and um, ideas uh, based on the needs of the users. Um, and that you're able to make calculated and strategic risks on these new ideas uh, to generate greater impact. And finally, what they call entrepreneurial spirit, the one that's down there in orange. Um, and that's the ability to look at the old problems with new eyes, learn from testing and failure, and being able to challenge the old ways of working. Um, co-creating your programs with users and just being uh, more agile. And what's nice about NetHope's resources is they do have um, workshops and materials where you can actually go through tutorials or do workshops with staff to kind of uh, learn these skills. So I'm gonna pause just for a moment and we're gonna queue up a poll and we'll see, I think I might have to stop sharing <laughs> to see the poll, but um, I'm curious, which of the following skills are most developed in your organization? Is it the tech literacy, collaboration, complex problem solving, digital responsibility, entrepreneurial spirit, or creativity and innovation? Let's see where we are. Interesting, great, eh, interesting. So we see kind of the uh, strengths in this group are around digital responsibility, privacy and security, and not a surprise coming from a European area. And then collaboration probably uh, has increased greatly in the last uh, month or two. And, um, and we can also see, I think we can skip the next poll. We can see from this poll where, um, where some areas to work on, which is complex problem solving and entrepreneurial spirit and maybe uh, tech literacy and creativity and innovation. Um, so this is the NetHope Framework Digital Transformation Journey. Um, I, I've put links to it in the resources um, and uh, to a couple of other frameworks, but I think this is one to explore. Um, and again, um, this was <clears throat> designed for organizations to kind of take, you know, their time <laughs> to see digital transformation as a journey, maybe over several years, um, even um, and even with emerging technologies that may be helping uh, the organization to speed up their digital transformation. Um, it, nothing, uh, I think, quite accelerated digital transformation as uh, COVID nineteen. Um, in the last uh, few months. And of course, when the pandemic struck um, on March 13th, um, literally two months ago, um, it started fast tracking digital transformation and innovation for all businesses as well as nonprofits. Um, so if we say that necessity is the mother of invention, um, the virus has forced many around the world, to, you know, just individuals to rethink our daily lives, 
you know, from how we work to going to school to our entertainment. So we've had travel bans, uh, school closures, uh, recommendations not to gather in large groups and to keep our distance from fellow humans to limit the spread of the virus. Many people were forced to turn to digital tools to keep some semblance of normal life. And it's been imperative to digitally transform our places of work and education to be able to operate efficiently. Because if we had to use the technology to deliver services and programs or else we wouldn't be able to do it. And so those nonprofits who are able to use the technology and to keep going and to rethink how, they're how to deliver their programs in the future by fast tracking digital transformation will be the ones who will be more likely to thrive in a post COVID world. Um, we don't know if or when we're gonna go back to normal. And I don't know what the situation is in Poland, but I know um, uh, here, at least here in the US, they're talking about moving very, opening up very slowly and there'll be a lot of changes. Okay, so I'll show you, that was the joke. <laughs> this uh, a new survey, who led digital transformation of your, of your company? Um, and of course, when the pandemic struck, uh, it accelerated uh, digital transformation innovation for everyone, including nonprofits. And uh, so now we're looking at this environment. This is, this is the big trend um, uh, because of the impact of COVID on our society. So uh, phase one, we had distributed society um society meaning we couldn't all go into the office so now we're we have become a distributed uh virtual workforce um across the board and um so consumers as well as workers have been sheltering in place and people are doing their if they're if they uh, if they're lucky they can do their job from home um the second phase is focused on community health so um if people have pivoted to develop applications and products to you know focus on health i'll show you some examples then we moved uh, we moved kind of into a lockdown mode where we weren't allowed to come out <laughs> and so more companies started to shift um, and try to address the increasingly high demand for home delivery and um and restaurants and businesses shifting to curbside pickup or limiting the number of people in the stores. And of course, um, media and event um, events have all shifted uh, to online conferences and, and broadcasts. Now, the phase we're in now, I'm probably like you, is this gradual reopening. And uh, so we see, I see many nonprofits starting to like shift with the use of technology to help to cover that space between being locked down and the going back to normal pre-COVID. And so um, so right now in the US, uh, we're in the process of trying to figure out how to reopen. Uh, it's very complicated. It's a big point of contention. Not, everybody, not every state is doing the same thing. Um, so there's many different uh, models that are out there. And then we have the post-COVID world. Um, once we have the vaccine, once we're able to um, protect, protect ourselves from this virus. Um, we will have what people are saying, the new normal. We don't know what that's going to look like. Um, we don't know the timeline. We're living with a lot of, um, in, in, uh, uncertainty, you know, people are saying from 18 months to four years. Um, uh, but what we do know is that probably emerging technologies are, um, the, uh, the age of automation, things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, bots, uh, will all be really, robots will all be really important in this future. And um, we need to keep our relationships digi digitally connected, but yet keep our uh, operations autonomous. So let me look at a, a couple of examples we'll share with you of how this is playing out, mostly in the nonprofit sector, mostly from the US. You may have um, similar examples in Poland. So let's go to this distributed society. All of a sudden, um, nonprofits that were used to going into offices and working together in an office have, have to that people work from, from home. And so this comes from an organization called Engender Health. And they're a global NGO that works on reproductive health and um, health and health rights. And like many uh, nonprofits, they had to adapt quickly to the evolving realities. Because um, a lot of their work was traveling to a location and working face-to-face. -face. They had a large office. They were used to face-to-face -face meetings and conference rooms. And um, and also because they work in healthcare, uh, the people, 
that they were collaborating with were extremely impacted. So all of a sudden they had to shift. And so their approach has been to really to stick with their principles and priorities, including health and well-being of their staff, which is sort of a new area that's being picked up by IT departments, supporting their communities, making progress on their mission, which includes the digital transformation. So nonprofits, um, at least here in the US, some of them had already been using some of these internal collaboration tools like Slack and Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And others really had to learn them very fast and, and to learn understand what remote culture is and what effective collaboration is. Um, we're seeing more, not only around the what we saw call the hard skills of collaboration, but really this kind of shift to well-being in the workplace. Um, what's coming behind, you know, we have the global health crisis, we have financial crisis, and then we also have a mounting uh, mental health crisis. So, a, a, a lot of focus on how do we create a distributed virtual workplace culture that is very supportive. And this is an example from the Canadian government, kind of uh, new working remotely pr uh, principles, which are really um, uh, having people focus on their um, mental health and developing relationships with other staff and to understand that their, their metrics for performance are, are, are changing given the changing situation. Um, here's another example. This is a organization that works with children and children's rights. And, um, and their main program was to provide in-person counseling and support groups and, um, and story circles for, for young kids. And all of a sudden they had to pivot to having these, um, the support groups happening on over video conferencing platforms or webinars um, so they can maintain their relationship with their clients and, and then to do um, the story time um, with young children through, through um, Facebook, Facebook Live. Um, so, so this was a whole very quick uh, digital transformation and rethinking of their programs. And even organizations where you wouldn't expect them to adopt the technology to keep their programs going, they have. And this is an example from the Paris Opera Ballet. Um, it's, it's a video that shows how the dancers were sort of still continuing to keep in shape, uh, keep training and keep dancing while at home. It's a really interesting to see um, each of the dancers sending in clips, um, kind of keeping in shape um, at, at their home or in their kitchens. Okay, so that's all phase one, which is the wide dispersal of clients and staff having to immediately turn to uh, the use of online platforms like Slack, collaboration platforms like Slack, Zoom, and others, and really uh, take what we say in the US, a crash course in online collaboration and communication so they could keep work going. Uh, whether internal, in, internally for staff or delivering programs to stakeholders. Um, as we progressed in the pandemic, um, community health became a priority. And here's where we see some interesting um, applications of um, artificial intelligence um, throughout. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, in this phase, again, uh, people are following the guidance for the most part of public health officials with frequent hand washing, social distancing, eliminating unnecessary travel, wearing face masks, um, standing in line. In addition, um, information is being supplied to people on what to do. And um, even companies in the U.S. have shifted um, their business operations to create needed health-related supplies. We've seen clothing manufacturers shift to uh, creating and manufacturing masks. So um, currently, um, in terms of vaccine and treatment development, we know that there isn't a vaccine yet, but medical researchers are working hard to change that. Um, and before they can develop a vaccine, they need to understand the virus's structure. So they're turning to artificial intelligence to generate predictions of the virus's structure. And this can save um, the scientists months of experimentations. So hopefully that they can um, fast track uh, fast track a, va a vaccine and get it to market faster than uh, what would have been possible. Um, and artificial intelligence has played a crucial role in that. Another area we've seen is uh, the prediction of outbreaks. While we've had the big outbreaks, um, uh, we uh, the only reason that we've been able to mitigate it 
is because we've been practicing lockdown. <laughs> but as soon as we op start to open up, the virus will begin to spread. And so um, there have been artificial intelligence algorithms um, that have analyzed hundreds of data sets um, of news, airline tickets, demographic um, data, climate data, even animal, animal populations to predict and track the virus. And this one was developed by a company called Blue Dot. And they were able to uh, take all this information from Wuhan before the uh, epidemic spread around the world. And they were able to predict the cities and the countries that would have the first outbreaks. And they're continuing to use these technologies to help monitor um, in addition to um, having testing and um, collecting public health numbers. Another uh, area, uh, you know, community health, a priority, we've seen the use of chatbots, which are, again are artificial intelligence that use something called natural language processing. And uh, this is an example uh, of, of using um, uh, the, the bot so people could check their systems remotely without coming into the hospital emergency room if they were experiencing mild symptoms uh, versus uh, urgent symptoms. And this was to help avoid uh, flooding uh, the hospitals with um, additional patients when they had so many that were in critical need and also then exposing them to um, um, the virus and potentially getting sicker. Um, here's another example. This comes from a nonprofit. Uh, as the uh, pandemic unfolded, there were a lot of people who were more vulnerable. Um, this was elderly people or people who were immune compromised who were unable to get out and get groceries. So a number of nonprofits have developed websites where they were like uh, dating dating applications where they were they were matching volunteers who were healthy, who were younger, who would volunteer to go out and go grocery shopping. Uh, for those who were elderly or more more at risk, and um, and this is a website that was kind of fast tracked and developed within a few weeks. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, mental health has been a, a, a huge crisis uh, also as a result of the virus of people um, losing people they know and losing jobs and uh, etc. So the the crisis text line, uh, which is an online text line to for people to get connected to a counselor if they're um, um, in a crisis, uh, in a mental health crisis. And here, um, the artificial intelligence uh, doesn't replace the human on the other end, but what it does is it analyzes all the texting data with privacy guidelines in place to determine which texters are most at risk and need to get um, a triage to a counselor right away. Um, and so they've had, um, what's been interesting about this is a huge surge of, um, response, uh, of, of demand, uh, for the service. And it's also has generated a lot of, um, additional data for, um, organizations to better understand this mental health crisis that, is, that we, um, that's currently starting to take off. Um, phase three, lockdown consumers. So people aren't able to get out, um, uh, or, or very um, limited. And a lot of or nonprofits in the US depend on doing fundraising events um, to raise money for their operations. And uh, many of these, uh, most of these were canceled uh, in March, even April, even in May. And uh, nonprofits have had to pivot these um, events to doing them online instead. And so here's an example from the March of Dimes, which would do a um, a, walk, a fundraising walk where people would sign up, they'd get a t-shirt, they would donate to the organization, and they would all go out and walk together um, in a city. Um, but unfortunately, this is not something that can happen now. Um, so they pivoted it to going online. Um, and, and the way this one worked is that uh, they, uh, they could sign up for it online, make a donation, uh, they would receive their t-shirt in the mail, and then they could walk around their neighborhood. So it was more of a distributed walk. Um, the same thing with um, supporter engagement. This is an example from a animal animal welfare organization, and every uh, year they would do a, a parade with the dogs and um, and the and the pets that were adopted, and they would all come together and do this annual parade. But obviously, uh, with COVID, they couldn't gather, and so it became a, a virtual fun day in which participants would do the walk at any time, and they took photos and then shared them. Um, 
on Facebook and other social media platforms. Um, uh, programs and services for lockdown consumers. We've seen the arts have been very hit very um, hard uh, in that people can't go into concert halls um, to hear a symphony or to hear a theater. So many orchestras and theaters have pivoted to the virtual live um, streaming uh, concerts and performances. The same thing has happened with nonprofit conferences and convenings. Um, I saw some stats yesterday where something like um, uh, 5,000 events <laughs> in the US were canceled or pivoted. Um, this is an example from uh, the Good Tech Fest, which is happening actually today. And what happened with them is that they had a, a, a large gathering for about 500 people that would happen every year in May for people who work on um, uh, uh, data uh, with nonprofits and for social impact. And so they decided early on, as soon as the pandemic struck, that they were going to pivot to digital. And because they decided to take their whole event online, they ended up saving a lot of money from the hotel fees and the food and, and the paper and all the things you need to have when you're having a physical event. And, um, and they put everything online. They were able to pivot their sponsors. So they were able to lower the cost of the event. They were able to ha uh, have actually more people sign up. Instead of having 500, they have more like 1,000 or over 1,000. And they were also able to uh, provide more scholarships to people who wanted to attend. So for them, they saw the opportunity in, in pivoting. Um, we're also seeing new business models for nonprofits. And this is an example of a restaurant that, um, a restaurant group that, um, uh, create, has created nonprofit um, pop-up restaurants. And one of them was called Be Awesome to Somebody. And so basically they were, uh, you could order online, I think it was pizza or chicken. And for every um, order, they would uh, give back to, um, to, the, to healthcare workers by providing them with uh, free meals. So, um, so we're seeing really interesting new business models in, the, um, here's another one. It's not nonprofit. I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, everybody who's in lockdown hasn't been able to get a haircut. So, and there are a lot of hairdressers who that's one reason why I don't have my camera on is that I very, really much need a haircut. Um, but, uh, so this is a site where out of work hairdressers can sign up and you can go online and you can, um, hire them to guide you through somebody else cutting your hair so you can get a half decent haircut. And so it's a win-win. Uh, you get your haircut, but you're also, but somebody who's out of work and doesn't have job or income is, is getting income. Uh, here's another example. This is uh, food banks, um, which were provide, you know, we're having a surge in demand for their services because so many people have been uh, laid off or put out of work in the US. And mostly the food banks would work where you people could come in to the facility and it would be like a grocery store and they could come in and shop. But given, um, given the lockdown, they couldn't do that. So they had to shift to online ordering and curbside pickup, as you can see in the, in the lower corner. And again, put this online ordering system and go through digital transformation very quickly. Here's another example. This is an organization that is a, a public garden. And every year they have a big benefit where they sell plants. Um, and of course the, the benefit had to be uh, pivoted to an online virtual plant sale. And again, what they had to do is uh, create like an online store, have people you know pick out the plants they wanted and uh, also set up curbside pickup with people could pick up their plants, but uh, they had to wear masks and gloves as did the volunteers giving them. Uh, we're also seeing, uh, this is not a nonprofit example, but lots of creativity in terms of different apps um, because uh, because of the social distancing rule and requiring people to wait in lines six feet apart and limiting the number of people who can come into stores, uh, there's long lines at the, at the different grocery stores. So there are apps popping up that allow you to look and see how long is the line and whether you go. Uh, another area of um, artificial intelligence that's being used is um, robots and before, you know, before social distancing became the first line of defense against the virus, automation 
um, you know, the robots doing parts of our jobs, we're gradually replacing some jobs. And so social distancing has really accelerated this trend. And so this is an example of a robotic floor cl cleaner at a supermarket. And so this allows, um, it's a safety precaution for staff um, because uh, the robot <laughs> can clean the floors and sanitize the um, supermarket. Um, but, you know, as life starts to come back to some kind of normal, we need to start to think about like automation and what the policy is around that. Um, uh, nonprofits now, we're in this sort of gradual opening phase. Um, nonprofits are reconfiguring their workspaces for when they go back. There's guidelines where people will have to wear masks in the workplace or have their desks split out. They're, they won't be allowed to use conference rooms. And there are also nonprofits are talking about, um, if they're larger ones, not having everybody go back into the office at the same time, working in shifts. And so this is kind of causing a rethinking of how do we now uh, have this distributed workforce where we have some people who are in the office and some people who aren't. So phase five, the post COVID world, we don't know where this is going. We don't know what new normal would look like. Um, uh, we know that the timeline is being forecasted from, you know, 18 months to four years. It kind of depends on where the, um, you know, vaccine development is, but we know that artificial intelligence in the age of automation will play a significant role. And actually, before I go in to talk a little bit about the age of automation, I wanted to um, kind of pause for a second and see if there were any questions that popped up. So Merrick has asked, uh, do, you, uh, do you not think that decisions made under COVID may lead to wrong outcomes when it is normal again? Question about nonprofits, of course. Um, uh, so I think that's really interesting because I think um, in this, you know, we're pivoting now, we're being forced to experiment, we're being forced to being innovative, and we're being forced to use the technology in, in some ways. Um, so I think might, what might come out of this is maybe there will be wrong decisions, but we will have been put in a mode of innovation and learning. And maybe when the new normal comes back, it won't be exactly like it was before. And we'll have gone through, we'll have developed our, our digital transformation skills of creativity, innovation, and problem solving to be able to serve our, um, our uh, stakeholders better. So I see it more as a, a glass half full versus a glass half empty. Oh yes, uh, a point here. I think our biggest struggle is to maintain contact with our clients who don't use digital tools fluently and whose digital competencies are rather low. I'm curious if you've had any thoughts on how to interact with such groups or or inspirations, or at least a good word for us. And this this too, this has been a problem in the U.S. as well. It's accentuated what we call the digital divide, and um, what we have. Uh, I can show you. Some, talk about some inspirations. What we have, I have seen is um, some new tech nonprofits um, emerge where they are uh, raising money to, to um, get um, tablets and low cost um, uh, technology into schools and into different health clinics that are in remote areas that are being cut off. Um, and one of them, actually, I thought I saw the other day that was very quite inspiring. It was a group of uh, technology leaders came together, created this organization where they could, um, what was happening is in a lot of the hospitals, because of uh, not people being very sick and in the ICUs um, and on their way to dying, uh, were not able to get their last goodbye with their family because they did not have the devices or uh, the devices weren't able to, you know, the hospitals didn't have the devices or the people didn't have the devices. So this was a, a, an organization that was raising money and raised uh, and was able to purchase and donate uh, many different uh, like uh, iPads and uh, tablets to those ICU wards so that patients could um, uh, say their last goodbyes to their families. And also so that the doctors and nurses who are short of prote protective gear um, uh, could also do some of their rounds remotely without using up some of those materials. Um, okay, uh, next question. Do you really believe in technology as an answer? No, I don't. <laughs> because I think uh, 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 it's with the digital transformation frameworks, um, the, um, 
you'll note that the skills were really, there was only one technology skill, which was tech literacy, but the rest were really about, from a NGO point of view, was really about people, process, um, innovation, problem solving. So I think that those <laughs> are the answer to, to all the challenges. And then technology can be deployed to help that. Okay, what would you recommend to an organization whose only contact with technology is email and Facebook profile? What are the first steps? Digital transformation. Okay, so I don't know how large your organization is, if it's only one person um, um, or if it's many people. Um, I think that uh, internally um, that you should, uh, for staff collaboration, maybe a first step might be looking at using some of the uh, digital collaboration uh, platforms, maybe Slack, um, some of them that are free, and, and Zoom as a way to um, start to collaborate online. And um, for, for, for Facebook profile, um, and, and, and this is I am an email as your contact with external constituents, would be to um, maybe to learn from them what their needs are and what, what the best way to communicate with them and then you begin to shape and develop your program. Great, so I'm looking at the time and I think what I will do is just go through a couple more examples of the uh, uh, age of automation. And, um, and it looks like I need to share my desktop again, which I'm going to do. Great, so the age of automation, which is coming. <laughs> um, and again, this is really about, um, if you were in the masterclass, we did talk a, um, a bit about this, um, that really uh, artificial intelligence boils down to having four ingredients, strategy, data, algorithm, and tools. And the sort of intelligent behavior is really pa about pattern matching. But artificial intelligence is, is very broad term that encompasses a lot of different types of technologies. Um, ro robotics, virtual personal assistance, natural language processing, which is the ability to uh, for computers to talk to us, social network analysis, machine learning. So there's all these different sub areas of artificial intelligence. and um, and um, in the nonprofit sector, what we see mostly are the use of bots um, that can help automate um, uh, giving information. We saw this increase during COVID. We saw it before COVID. I expect to see it increase post COVID, um, particularly because a lot of the, um, the, the bot authoring platforms like Facebook Messenger make it more accessible to nonprofits. And so this is a, a, a bot for a, um, uh, uh, disaster relief organization. It's on their Facebook page and they're, uh, they have a very small staff. And whenever there was a disaster, there was a lot of information coming in and request and all the time, 24 hours, seven days a week. And it was more than that, what that one staff person could handle. So having a bot that bot that would help automate, um, giving information to people who were requesting it, um, really save them time. And, and, and they didn't, it doesn't prevent their people talking to a, a human, but it helps them triage again, getting uh, them to a human faster. In addition, the other thing that started to happen with emergency relief is that in addition to people asking for help, there are people who are asked who want to help and help fundraise. And so the spot was also helping people set up uh, different fundraising campaigns to provide disaster relief. Um, Here's another example. This is from the uh, Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, which is now shut down. Um, but this is something that they were experimenting with before the pandemic um, because they had all of their artworks in storage and they couldn't display everything at once in their limited space. So they set up a texting bot where you could text a keyword um, in and it would respond with showing them a picture of, um, uh, of some artwork. So it was a way to get um, uh, their collection to more people um, without having to invest in physically expanding their space. Um, 
Here's another example of, uh, again, bot bots used in to, for engagement and to influence policy. And this comes from UNICEF and they have uh, messenger bots and Twitter bots uh, that young people can use to interview people in their community around different issues. And uh, this is the example from Liberia where they um, polled uh, young people on a variety of issues and they found out that um, uh, that the, that, uh, that teachers at their schools were exchanging grades for sex. And so some 86% said um, yes to this question, uncovering a widespread problem. And this, uh, and so UNICEF was able to use this information to prompt Liberia's Minister of Education to work with UNICEF on addressing this issue. Um, and finally, this is an example of uh, from a, another UN agency, UNHCR, of uh, refugee camp mapping. And so now, especially now, but before, it's very labor intensive to go into the different refugee camps, which are now very overcrowded, and to figure out, you know, what buildings should be used for food and housing and how it's working. And so um, they were using a combination of artificial intelligence and satellite imagery to figure out um, how to reconfigure the camps to handle the increased demand. And what this did would save uh, a lot of travel and on-site. Um, so those are just a few examples of of how um, nonprofits have been using these new technologies um, before the COVID. And again, I think these uh, kind of best practices, um, two basic ones have not changed. Um, one is that we, you know, you can always, you need to pressure test your idea. Um, you know, AI may not be the right tool to use. So it's good to have uh, technologists work with you um, on the design of this. And then a evo new evolving field called participatory um, machine learning, which is um, really involving the end user to help you design um, the use of um, AI so it is effective. So in conclusion, I wanna say that digital transformation is really a journey of maturity requiring these skills, um, technology literacy, collaboration, problem solving, innovation, digital responsibility, and entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, the pandemic fast-tracked the process, um, sort of forced us into a mode of experimentation and innovation and shifting. Not all of that may be relevant post-COVID, but maybe it's taught us a new skill and that post-pandemic artificial intelligence will continue to play a critical role in digital transformation for nonprofits. So, and I want to remind you of that bit.ly uh, where you can uh, find links and, and uh, the slides as well. And I'll stop sharing here to see if there's other questions. Um, oh, great question. Do you know of any data showing the level of digital NGO in the US and how many of them are as developed as those you described? Uh, great question. Um, and probably the ones that I'm describing, those are the early adopters. And if you were to look at the data, it would probably be a bell curve or a mountain where we have fewer at the very beginning, fewer at the very end, and most in the middle. The uh, benchmarking data, there's a uh, N10, which is the nonprofit technology uh, network, I'm, I'm on the board there, does have a benchmarking tool that is looking at this for just US um, organizations. And uh, what we're looking at are the ones that are, there's fewer cases of these, they're more advanced, but we're looking to them for learning and inspiration. Oh, great, oh, great. Thank, thank you. you.